Winter's Tale is a terrible play, or so at least three centuries of critics would have us believe. In the late 1600s, the neoclassicists hated it because of its flagrant violation of the classical unities of time, place, and action. Sixteen-year gap, Cecilia, Bohemia, and back to Cecilia, plot, subplot, and sub-subplot, they thought it was an outrage. In the 18th century, they abhorred the fact that the plot was both comic and tragic. Why ruin a perfectly good romantic comedy with death and misery? Alexander Pope flatly refused to accept that the play was even written by Shakespeare. The Victorians hated it because of its blatant disregard for historical fact, not to mention its scandalous references to sexuality. The play is riddled with anachronisms, inaccuracies, and improprieties that were summarily excised for the benefit of Victorian society. Even in 1918, critics had no pity. They maintained that The Winter's Tale was an experiment in genre gone very wrong. Shakespeare, quote, bungled it. Characters with inscrutable motives, unrealistic and unnatural scenes, a plot that jumps around indiscriminately in time and space and two entirely different moods within one play. Not to mention time personified, a bear mauling, and a resurrection all of which take place on stage. How did this play get produced at all? Most artists resolve their particular objections through adaptation. In 1756, for example, David Garrick simply cut the play in half, eliminating the bothersome tragedy and leaving him with a sentimental romantic comedy entitled Florizel and Perdita. In spite of centuries of heated criticism, the Winter's Tale was not always so detested. When it first premiered, it was performed six times at the English court, and it remained popular throughout the first half of the 17th century. So why did this play work so well in Shakespeare's day and then vanish from the stage for three centuries after? The reason, I think, is the thing that people criticize the most about the Winter's Tale is actually its strongest element, its structure. The structure of the Winter's Tale is the key to understanding the play as a whole and is what makes it successful in the theater. There are two ways of looking at the structure of the Winter's Tale. First, in two halves, in which the first half is tragic and the second half is comic. Secondly, the Winter's Tale can be divided into thirds that represent the changing seasons in the play. David Gammon's production with the ART Institute is a great illustration of how this play can be split into halves. Gammon's concept of the play focused heavily on the opposition between the two worlds of Cecilia and Bohemia. The first act is set in tragic Cecilia, in a world of order and control, filled with straight lines, cages, ice and glass, evening gowns, and string quartets. The second act feels like almost an entirely different play. The world of Bohemia is bright, warm, and wild, featuring dance parties, beach balls, folding chairs, and blender drinks. Gammons felt very strongly that each half should have its own distinct feel that contributed concretely to its respective tragedy or comedy. And as he demonstrates, the structure functions well theatrically. It also reveals the generic experiment that Shakespeare is attempting in the play, because although it seems to have a traditional Elizabethan plot structure, it simultaneously refuses to be classified as a history, tragedy, or comedy, as most of Shakespeare's other plays can. As an alternative to these categories, critics have proposed that the Winner's Tale falls under the genre of tragicomedy. This is a logical suggestion, as tragicomedy was a form that was actually acknowledged in Shakespeare's time. In a preface to a play written around 1608, playwright John Fletcher identified tragicomedy as, quote, wanting deaths, which is enough to, bring it no, to make it no tragedy, yet bring some near it, which is enough to make it no comedy. The first half of the play is, in many aspects, a tragedy. Leontes' fatal flaw of jealousy causes him to tear apart his own family. His actions cause the death of his son, wife, and presumably daughter. If the play was a tragedy, it would end here, when Leontes realizes his mistake and there is no hope for redemption. The second half of the play, in contrast, 
has all of the characteristics of comedy. Low-brow characters, a pastoral festival, a clown and a trickster, a romantic affair, and several characters in various disguises. Within this structure, however, the ever-present critics have voiced their objection. The transition between tragedy and comedy is awkward at best and tasteless at worst. And here, they might have a point. How does a play make a convincing transition from heartbreaking grief to playful comedy? Shakespeare chose to use a bear. Exit pursued by a bear. It is Shakespeare's most famous stage direction, but the bear's presence is essentially unnecessary. Why not just have Antigonus drown with the rest of his crew? Many have had difficulty deciding how to interpret Antigonus' death, but the apparent problem is actually a brilliant device. The double take of Antigonus' dash off stage and the clown's subsequent description of his gory death allows the event to be played and perceived as both tragic and comic. Somehow, we pass from tragedy to comedy within the same incident. The arrival of the shepherd and the clown, lower class characters, a major characteristic of comedy, signals a change in the air. Their banter and overblown descriptions, even of the tragedy itself, are a major shift in mood. And, most importantly, Perdita is saved. The story goes on. The shepherd's famous line sums up Shakespeare's skillful transition. Thou next with things dying, I with things newborn. The scene on the coast of Bohemia provides a rite of passage that the audience needs at this point in the play a passage from the old theatrical contract to a completely new one. While the tragic first half engenders a hostile relationship between Leontes and the audience, the change to comedy attempts to win back the audience's trust. The play makes this switch in several ways, but mainly through a number of soliloquies in a row that are directed to the audience. Antigonus, the shepherd, time, and Autolycus. These soliloquies do not have the tone of aggression as Leontes did. Instead, they confide in the audience and encourage their participation. The abrupt and explosive change that occurs in this scene through a bear mauling, a maritime disaster, the clown's bloody descriptions of the feasting bear and dying sailors, and finally the appearance of time himself, all combine to shock the audience into awareness. We watch the second half with a new self-consciousness and delight, embracing the artificiality of fiction and theater, rather than condemning the tackiness of an actor in a bearskin. Immediately after, time enters to lead the audience to a new perception of the play by reasserting its theatricality. His presence is a deliberate departure from realism, making the 16-year gap acceptable. But simultaneously, Time reminds the audience that he also has power over us, emphasizing the similarities of the world of the play and our own. Time, then, is incredibly important in The Winner's Tale, both in his actual character and as a pervading theme. In the second interpretation of the structure, time is manifested through the seasons. Instead of halves, the play is split into thirds, winter, spring, and fall. And instead of tragedy and comedy, the focus is on nature, fate, magic, and redemption. In this way, The Winter's Tale can be described as a romance, a narrative where virtue struggles against human imperfection in a world governed by both chance and the gods. Romance also had its roots in religious plays about the suffering and conversion of medieval saints, plays that were, of course, full of miracles. These same plays likely also had a significant influence on Shakespeare's writing. And viewed from this perspective, the late romances can be seen as one character's spiritual journey of self-discovery.